Welcome everyone to the last video of the year and the final episode in this Pokemon Platinum introductory series. And while this is the end of the year and the end of daily December, don't worry, this is not the end of the Platinum series. In 2024, it will continue alongside all of my other series. Of course, in today's video, I'm going to be playing Pokemon Platinum with only a Giratina, and it's mostly going to be staying in its altered form throughout this run, just because I don't have access to the item that would cause it to transform. Before we get into the run, I want to take some time and thank all of the people that have helped me out with the channel over the past year. This section will be fairly lengthy, and I considered putting it at the end of the episode, but then most people won't hear it, and everyone who has contributed really deserves to have their work recognized. After all, this is most certainly not a one-man show. First of all, everyone who supports me on Patreon or through YouTube memberships, you directly help me pay everyone who contributes, and that takes so much stress off my shoulders, just knowing that the bills are going to be paid month to month. My video editor Sean deserves serious props, especially over the last three months, because his workload has skyrocketed. He's been working on the channel for over two years now, and this really shows in his work. He just knows how these videos need to be put together. Next, I want to thank Brian for bringing to life my thumbnails with custom art each week. A few of these stick out in my mind throughout this year that are just excellent. I want to give you some examples of his excellent work. Number one would be Cleffa with its tiny little tongue sticking out. Also, this Mewtwo art is really epic, and I really, really love the fact that he was able to make 10 to cruel look like it's red and blue sprite. So thanks Brian for making my thumbnails have so much personality. Please check out his link in the description if you want to commission something yourself. Serena Vale also contributes so much to the channel in two meaningful ways. Number one, moderating all of my chats during live streams, as well as my Discord servers, and also contributing so much art. This is my avatar, sometimes custom Pokemon art, as well as all the prominent trainers that I fight throughout my series. Perhaps their best work this year was the Hypno Sandwich. I absolutely love this art, it is just so good. Again, if you want to commission something yourself, please check out the link in the description. I want to thank Rick for doing so many of the basic cuts. This is essentially going in and finding all the door transitions as well as parts where I'm walking around and we want to remove like boring footage. He has been doing this all year and it has really streamlined the process for both myself and Sean. So thank you so much Rick. So now let's talk about the people who volunteer to help me out. I cannot state how much I am grateful for all of the time they put in. First up, we have Wile, who has been doing so much incredible programming for me. I honestly could not have moved things forward as quickly without his help. To me, he feels like a psychic type in Generation 1, honestly just broken. Every time I put a challenge in front of him, he solves it in like 30 minutes and I'm left just kind of stunned. If you're looking for a tangible piece of his work, the fact that the experience bar animates is like 100% due to him. He also significantly aided in the process of helping me with my decryption algorithm for Platinum. I would not have been able to solve it without his key pieces of insight. So the fact that we are seeing this series right now is largely a result of the work that he put in. There's another person who is instrumental in bringing Platinum to all of you, and that is the developer of Gamehook, Flame Sage. Without this free-to-use tool, my content would not be what it is, and I am eternally grateful for the fact that he has also been extremely generous with his time, helping me to learn programming. Building off of Gamehook, some other people have developed applications which can also aid the solo running community. So I want to say a huge thanks to Otto for developing the rooting software that helps me get very specific damage ranges against every trainer in Generation 1 and Generation 2. Also, this tool is probably going to be helpful in future generations as development continues. I want to thank Oatspear for developing my auto splitter, which I have used over the last year and a half. While it has been recently retired for a different solution, without it the data that I have collected to date would not have been preserved, and I am really glad to have these historical archives. I want to thank Peep for helping everyone get assigned to the proper Pokemon during the credits sequence. Managing this takes so much work off of my plate. 
And I also want to thank Locke Kirby for developing the software that allows me to automatically generate the footage that is in the credit sequence. Harry is responsible for all the graphs and charts that we see in the videos, although a lot of the ideas for these charts came directly from Kevin earlier on in the year. Last, I want to say thank you to Snowy for developing a new emulator, which is specifically designed for solo challenges. It is so good, and I will talk about it more starting in 2024. If this is the first video you're watching on my channel, thank you for making it through all of that. I really only do this kind of thing once a year, but I felt it was important to take the time to recognize everyone. Now, let's talk about Pokemon Platinum's Box Art Legendary. Of course, its base stats are incredible. 150 HP, 100 attack and special attack, 120 defense and special defense, and 90 speed. When Giratina is in the Distortion world, or it's holding the Grisius Orb, it will change into its origin form. This causes its stats to change so that it's more offensive than defensive. In that case, it has 120 attack and special attack, and 100 defense and special defense. That said, it's only going to be in this form for one battle in the run, because the orb is only available in the post-game after Cynthia is defeated. In the future, I'm sure I will revisit Giratina and try it with the Grisius Orb from the very beginning of the playthrough, because I think that'll be an interesting comparison to make. But today, I'm not going to be doing that. Of course, as a legendary Pokemon, it has a slow growth rate, but I don't think that's going to be a big downside because its typing, Ghost Dragon, is very good. In Platinum, it has four single weaknesses to Ghost, Ice, Dragon, and Dark. But it's immune to two types, Normal and Fighting, and it's resistant to six, Poison, Bug, Fire, Water, Grass, and Electric. Also, as a legendary, it has a completely busted move pool. It starts with Dragon Breath and Scary Face, and then through level up, it gets Ominous Wind, Ancient Power, Dragon Claw, Shadow Force, and from there, the moves are going to get less relevant just because they're obtained at such a high level. And then through TM and HM, it learns a lot of good moves Iron Tail, Thunderbolt, Return, Psychic, Shadow Ball, Aerial Ace, Charge Beam, Dragon Pulse, and Stone Edge. As a balanced attacker, Giratina is going to be just as effective using special moves as it would be using using physical moves. That gives me a lot of flexibility in what my final move set is going to look like. There are two last things I need to mention. In this series, I'm going to be using a neutral nature, so in this case, Hardy, and its ability is Pressure, which overall isn't really relevant for solo challenges. Outside of Jubilife City, I have to face Barry for the second time. He leads with Starly, and in this case, I can just use Dragon Breath to one-shot it. Next is Piplop, and I had him pick this Pokemon because I thought out of all the starters, maybe it would be the strongest against Giratina. Overall, this legendary shouldn't be struggling against any of them. On Route 203, I fight some optional trainers to level Giratina up to 10 so that it can learn the move Ominous Wind. This has the same secondary effect as Ancient Power, which is a 10% chance to boost all of your stats by one stage. Unlike in Generation 2, this effect can trigger even if you knock the opponent's Pokemon out. It's really interesting that Giratina gets both of these moves, because at level 20 it's going to learn Ancient Power as well. If we consider PP though, that is a bit unfortunate, because both of these moves only have 5. That said, I doubt this legendary is going to be too shotting many foes. As the last video in my Pokemon Platinum mini series, I want to take the time in this video to talk about the game design and my overall thoughts on it after doing a total of seven runs. In some ways, this video is going to serve as a preliminary review of Pokemon Platinum, and I'm sure at some point in the future I'll do a much more in-depth review once I have more experience with the game. First, I'll draw your attention to the design of the gym. It is similar in concept to both Brock and Roxanne's gym. There are paths to take to get around all the trainers, or you can just fight them and head straight for the gym leader. This parallel is also reinforced by the fact that these three gym leaders are all rock type specialists. Generation 2 is the odd one out here. The gym is designed similarly, but you can't skip the trainers, and Faulkner is a flying type specialist. I really like this game design, especially from a solo challenge perspective, because then fighting the trainers is an optional act that I can choose to participate in. For a Pokemon that's very strong, I can skip them saving the time, and for a weaker Pokemon, I can invest in leveling before the gym leader. With Giratina, I am taking the second approach despite it being very strong, just because with the slow growth rate, I'm still only going to be level 12 by the time I'm facing Rourke.
The strategy here is fairly simple. I want to be spamming Ominous Wind to try to get the Omni Boost, which can speed up my results. This was slightly counterintuitive to me because I'm so used to ghost type moves dealing physical damage. In this case, though, Ominous Wind is special, so it hits Rourke's Pokemon for good damage. It's doing about half to the Kranidos, and he wants to heal it really badly, but even if he did, his best move is Pursuit, so it really can't do that much to Giratina. His ace goes down, leaving only Onyx, and of course, this thing is just really bad, so Giratina has no problems with the first gym leader despite being slightly underleveled. Any Generation 4 review would be incomplete if it did not mention the pacing of the game. I'll talk about the technical considerations later on, for now I want to talk about the narrative structure. For whatever reason, the developers felt the need to just shoehorn in way more dialogue. For example, Professor Rowan here lectures for so long and he really didn't need to. A couple carefully worded lines to contextualize Team Galactic was all that was really needed here. Simply deliver the information to the player that these are the bad guys and then force the player to fight them alongside Lucas. When playing these challenges, I am hyper aware of this flaw in the script because I see all of this dialogue go by and it just wastes so much time. When solo running a game like Pokemon Yellow, there is very little downtime due to dialogue. Mostly, you are just preparing for the next fight in your mind while the short amount of dialogue scrolls and then the battle begins. That leads to a highly compelling and intense experience where every second in the game you have to be thinking about something useful. Of course this is with the caveat that I'm playing the game at 4 times speed, Generation 1 does run slowly if you're playing it on 1 times speed. Even on a multiple of game speed, Platinum does not run this way. Every time there are extended dialogue sections like this, your brain can just shut down and wander on to other thoughts. This creates a very distinct feeling to doing a Pokemon Platinum playthrough when compared with earlier generations. I thought coming into the series that Pokemon Platinum was going to be the hardest and most intense game that I had played so far, but coming out of this series, it actually feels like the most relaxing game to play. And I think this is largely due to the fact that the script is just quite bloated. Another thing that impacts the pacing of the play is that most of the routes feel fairly short, they just kind of get you from one location to the next location. In this case I'm next headed to the Valley Windworks where I'm going to face Commander Mars. Between literally every gym leader in the game, there is always at least one major battle that is not a gym battle. It's either a rival or something related to the plot. This makes the pacing of the game feel very regular and consistent. Before becoming a Poketuber I was a musician and a composer, and one thing with writing music that you learn very early on is that you don't want to create too much predictability, otherwise the listener is just going to zone out and not be interested in whatever musical ideas you are presenting to them. The ability to establish a formula and then break away from it really keeps things so much more engaging, and I don't really feel like Platinum is successfully doing that. It kind of just feels like 4 bar phrase after 4 bar phrase after 4 bar phrase, it's unrelenting and monotonous. That is, if you're not having problems, in this case the Perugly does knock Giratina out because it got a critical hit with Faint Attack. So I think that while the underlying structure is not very ideal, I do think that there is some redemption to be found from Pokemon Platinum just because these battles are actually fairly difficult. But Giratina really shouldn't have lost to Mars, it was exclusively because of the critical hit, so without one, I defeat her on my next attempt. While the pacing of the game narratively causes regularity and at times boredom, the random trainers throughout the region do help spice things up because these are difficult just like they are in Generation 1. In those games we have so many notable characters that have emerged over my time doing solo challenges. I'm thinking of the Wrapping Lass, Self-Destructing Hiker, and Hypno Sandwich. Generation 2 and Generation 3 have many less notable NPCs, but right now it seems like Platinum fixes this issue. For example, inside of Eterna Forest there is this mandatory double battle, and one of their team members is Pachirisu, and it can paralyze you. There's also the Endeavor Trainer on Cycling Road, and then the double battle later on with the Raichu and Gyarados which cause so many problems for Torterra. This is definitely not an exhaustive list. For example, after clearing the forest and journeying into the gym, I fight Last Caroline, and yeah, her Cherubi is not a problem, but the Roselia sometimes is. It can paralyze you with Stun Spore and then use Mega Drain to drain your health. 
Also, the Cherubi likes to set up Leech Seed, which deals 1 8th damage per turn, and all of this stacks up and Giratina faints. I did not save before this battle, so I'm gonna have to let all my HM users faint, black out, and come back in here and try her again. A loss like this is always frustrating for both me and you, but it does make these challenges more interesting, because I'm gonna need to stay alert when facing her in the future. This really does help give the game a sense of excitement, where I am anticipating smaller challenges along the way to the big ones. And the next major battle is coming up right away, so let's see how Giratina does against Gardenia. Actually, Editor Scott here, I am coming back to do this voiceover after the fact because I realize I forgot to talk about the puzzle in this gym, and that's largely because this is not a puzzle. You just battle all the trainers and after each of them, you have to watch an animation which takes forever and the screen like goes around and these little jets have to turn off. Overall, this is definitely the worst gym in Pokemon Platinum, and what makes this even more disappointing is it is a redesign from Diamond and Pearl. Granted, the gym puzzle in that game is not much more interesting. What I really dislike here is the fact that it doesn't give the player any choices or chances to test their skill. I guess you get your skill tested by the battles, after all the Rosalia was a problem, but overall I don't think that that's as interesting as giving the player the choice between fighting the trainers or skipping them, moving faster, and giving up all the experience. Whenever the game provides this kind of choice to the player, it really makes solo challenges much more engaging and interesting, from both the player and the viewer's perspective. Okay, so with the worst puzzle in the game out of the way, now I'm ready to face Gardenia. Her lead is Turtwig, and this thing really likes to set up with either Sunny Day or Reflect, so that her following two Pokémon are stronger. I was hoping for an ominous wind boost here, but I don't get one before the Turtwig faints. Next is Cherum. I continue using Ominous Wind, that depletes its PP, and with no Omni Boosts, I guess I'm gonna have to use Dragon Breath. It just barely doesn't knock out the Cherum, giving it a chance to set up Leech Seed before her ace Roserade comes in. Right out of the gate, Dragon Breath gets a critical hit, leaving the Roserade with red health. The Roserade attempts to stall things out using Stun Spore, but I have a Cherry Berry to counter that strategy, so Giratina is able to win. The wonderful prize is of course a bunch of mandatory dialogue. Although in this case, after I finish talking to Barry and Cyrus, just behind this statue of Palkia, I can pick up a Draco Plate. I really should have picked this up earlier to make things a little bit easier against Gardenia. And in this solo running review of Pokemon Platinum, I should really spend some time to talk about held items specifically the type enhancing category. Starting in generation 2, these items were introduced to the series, and they boost the power of a specific type's move by 10%. That was also the case in generation 3, and then in generation 4, this boost was buffed to 20%. Because these items now give such an outstanding boost to damage, they're going to be far more central to Pokemon's success. A great analogy for this is the type-based badge boosts in Generation 2. Whenever you're playing a Pokemon that is a flying bug or normal type, you're gonna have an advantage when compared with Pokemon like Electric and Fire types, which receive their type boost much later into the game. This means Dragon types will have a distinct advantage since this item comes so early into the run. For example, the Electric type has a disadvantage here because the Zap Plate is obtained just before Volkner. Alternatively, a Magnet could be obtained, but that's also fairly late into the playthrough because you have to get it on the Iron Island. I want to talk about the Spooky Plate because that's the other one that would boost Giratina's same type attack bonus moves, but I'll wait to do that until we arrive in Heart Home City. For now, I have to face Commander Jupiter. Her Zubat isn't a threat, but the Skun Tank could be with Night Slash. Dragon Breath doesn't do half, it uses Night Slash and does about a quarter. I figured that I would survive a critical hit, and in this case we get to test, because the Skun Tank does crit, and yes, Giratina survives. Even with some healing from a Citrus Berry, it isn't enough to save her ace. Cycling Road is next, and just like in Generation 1, you can skip every single trainer here. After filming 6 playthroughs, I'm quite proficient at this, so I don't hit any today with Giratina. Underneath Cycling Road, I pick up the PP up, there's also a hidden ether over here by this honey tree, and then I go into the Wayward Cave, in here I grab a Max Ether, a Rare Candy, as well as the TM for Earthquake, which yes, Giratina can learn. Of course, I'm gonna 
teach the powerful ground type move in the place of scary face. The fact that this move is available so early on is really going to benefit ground types in solo runs. Just outside of Mount Cornet, I pick up a rare candy, and then as I do battle against a random trainer, I should probably address my Giratina's nickname, because I'm sure you've been curious about it. About a year after my wife and I had started dating, I suggested that we play Pokemon games together, and she was really excited about this. We started with Pokemon Sun and Moon, doing a couples challenge where after every trial you battle each other, and then the winner gets to steal a Pokemon from the other trainer's team. It was really fun, and uh, definitely feelings were hurt at some points. <laughs> Anyways, as we progressed through a bunch of other Pokemon games, eventually we made it to Pokemon Platinum. While I didn't finish my playthrough of the game, she did, and during hers, she used Giratina, and I forget what her nickname was, but it was something really silly like Bob the Giratina. Anyways, I figured that I should give her naming rights for this playthrough because she does love this Pokemon so much. She thinks it's very cute and lovable, and I guess that makes sense. She does also love horror movies. On the theme of random human names, today she chose Jerry. Now that I've reached Heart Home City, it's time to come back to the spooky plate. It's available within Amity Square, and to gain access to this area, you have to use one of the permitted Pokemon. This Bulbapedia graphic shows us which Pokemon are eligible, and honestly, the list is not very big. I'm never going to have one of the starter Pokemon, which were all added in Platinum version, so I'm basically stuck with the Pokemon from Diamond and Pearl. Luckily for me, I am always catching Psyduck as one of my HM users, so I will have access to this area. That said, I didn't actually know that Psyduck was permitted in here, so today I won't be obtaining the Spooky Plate, but luckily it isn't walled off for other Ghost-type Pokemon. And I think thematically it makes sense that this item is available in this city. After all, Fantina is the gym leader. Her gym has a really awesome puzzle, at least from an aesthetic perspective. Having to navigate a dark area with a flashlight is so perfect for a ghost-type gym. All of the trainers in here have flashlights which point in the direction they are currently looking, and they also walk around. This creates an atmosphere of tension whenever you're trying to dodge one of them in search of the little blue plate that shows you which door you need to go through. I think I would look on this puzzle much less favorably if all of the trainers didn't move around. That fact alone makes this area really fun. It should go without saying, this is the second puzzle in the game that I really like. It also stacks up well with solo running, because if you are skilled enough to skip all of the trainers, then you can go through here very quickly. But it also provides a lot of experience in case you want to do extra training. Game mechanics that provide choice to the player make these videos more interesting, and they also make the runs more enjoyable for me to play. This decision-making process is even more interesting because the choice is a one-way door. If you skip the trainers and then defeat Fantina, you can't come back and battle them later for experience. In a casual playthrough of Pokemon, these kind of choices don't really feel that great, but in a solo run, they make you think intensely about your strategy and punish you if you make the wrong choice. This reward players based on their skill level, and I think that that makes solo challenges in Platinum just so much more interesting. In this playthrough, I wanted to fight some of the trainers, but then I realized I'm depleting Ominous Wind's PP, and I didn't want to backtrack to the Pokemon Center, so I decided to face Fantina now. Her first Pokemon is Duskull, Ominous Wind one-shots. That's encouraging, but I'm almost out of PP with Ominous Wind, so I'm going to have to use a different move soon. Because of the Draco Plate, Dragon Breath is going to be doing the most damage, plus it has a 30% chance to inflict paralysis. I take Miss Magius down to Orange Health, it heals with a Citrus Berry, uses Shadow Ball, dealing about a third, and then my next Dragon Breath inflicts paralysis. The next Shadow Ball takes Giratina to Orange Health, Fantina heals with a Super Potion, but because of paralysis I get two more attacks in and knock her ace out. Last is Haunter, it is able to attack with Shadow Claw, but this is a physical move and Haunter does not have good attack. As a result I'm able to get two Dragon Breaths in and earn myself the third badge. The prize for this victory is TM65, which is Shadow Claw. It's a physical ghost type move that has 70 base power and 100% accuracy. It's here that I want to take some time to examine how moves are named. In this case, Shadow Claw has a high critical hit ratio. Why is this not Shadow Slash? To me, it seems like all moves that have similar secondary effects should be named by a similar schema. An example of this is Thunder Fang, Fire Fang, and Ice Fang. All of them have a 10% chance to inflict a status condition based on their typing, and in addition to this chance, they have a 10% chance of causing a flinch. 
When learning the game, this makes things much more intuitive for new players. If you see a move that says Slash, you know it has a high critical hit rate, and if you see a move that says Claw, then maybe it has a chance to raise your attack stat or something like that. After all, that is the effect of Metal Claw. And speaking of another Claw move, which we're going to gain access to very soon, Dragon Claw, this one has no secondary effect, just to confuse players like me a little bit more. Outside of the city, I have to face Barry, and hopefully you are seeing the formula that I mentioned before. It's Gym Leader, then some other type of secondary battle, then next Gym Leader, rinse and repeat. This is the noteworthy battle between Fantina and Maylene. In this case with Giratina, Barry is not a challenge, even with a status condition. Another example of offering the player interesting choices is in Salacion Town, where you have to choose if you enter the ruins and grab the Defog TM or just skip it altogether. This is very similar to the choice to enter Sprout Tower in Generation 2 or skip it. As I've demonstrated in my channel over the last year, even on 4x game speed, navigating caves that are dark is not only possible but actually quite easy without the HM. Because of that, Sprout Tower becomes an area of the game that Pokemon only go into if they want to do additional training before Faulkner. Salacion Ruins is not nearly as interesting, just because there aren't as many trainers here. That said, there are other notable items like the Mind Plate, which boosts the power of Psychic-type moves. I think over the next year, as my play develops in this game, I will start skipping this area. On Route 215, there is one small choice, which is to pick up the Fist Plate or to skip it. With Giratina, I am not going to make it to Aura Sphere today. There is no way this thing needs level 90 to beat the game. In Veilstone City, I go into Maylene's Gym, so let's do another Gym Puzzle review. This one becomes tedious after you figure out what the solution is. That said, I like how creative it is, I love the aesthetic, and I think it's very fitting for a fighting type gym. It also does provide the player a chance to show their skill level. If you are completely inexperienced with Pokemon Platinum, then this puzzle could cause you some problems and delay your final result. I think this one is just kind of middle of the road, probably second worst of the four that we have examined so far. Okay, so now let's take on Maylene. Her first Pokemon is Metatite, I go for Dragon Claw and get the one hit. Next is Machoke, Dragon Claw does more than half. It uses Rock Tomb, lowering my speed, and now I am going to be slower than the Lucario that's next. But that's totally fine, because I have Earthquake. It's super effective, taking it to red health on turn one. And the Steel type has no hope, because Metal Claw isn't doing much to Giratina. On the next route, I can pick up a PP up, and I just want you to note that this is a little bit out of the way. Again, making for an interesting choice between real time and an item that can benefit your playthrough. Because at level 40, which is only 5 levels away, I'm going to learn the move Shadow Force, which is really good. I do think this item is useful with Giratina. Just outside of the hotel, I get caught by this tuber. With the number of times you have to backtrack through this location, Speedrunner was definitely right. Fighting her the first time you come through here is the fastest approach. Later on this route, I pick up a heart scale, which is very convenient timing because in Pastoria City there is the move reminder. He's not relevant with Giratina, but placing him after the fourth gym is a smart choice. In Generation 3, it feels like he came a little bit too early, but this feels just right. Outside of Pastoria City, I can make a choice to go over here to pick up an elixir as well as a rare candy, again costing some real time for what could be two useful items. After that, the monotonous structure continues because I have to face the rival before gaining access to Crasher Wake's gym. This puzzle was really enjoyable for me the first couple times I played Platinum, but after a week of doing it, it is one that's very similar to Maylene's gym. Once you know the solution, there is no skill involved. However, there are optional trainers in here, which gives you an interesting choice between experience. That said, overall in the series, these puzzles are really good, especially compared to anything in Generation 2. Those games definitely have the worst gym puzzles. Okay, now it's time to face Crasher Wake, and over the last week I have learned that he is usually quite challenging. Up first is Gyarados, and I think in retrospect I should have taught Shockwave in the place of Ominous Wind just so I could knock this thing out in a single hit. Without an electric type move, I can't one shot, and I can't even two hit without an Omni Boost, which gives Crasher Wake the time he needs to heal it with a Hyper Potion. Gyarados knows Bite, which is super effective, and it deals more than half to Giratina before I knock it out. Wake chooses Floatzel next, and it knows Crunch, Dragon Claw can't do half, 
and then it uses Ice Fang, knocking Giratina out. Instead of training, I'm going to use Rare Candies to go up from level 37 to 40, where Giratina can learn Shadow Force. This is its signature move, and it's honestly really broken. Base 120 power with 100% accuracy. It's physical and it takes two turns to execute, but like Fly, Giratina will be semi-invulnerable during the first turn. After learning the move, I continue using Rare Candies up to level 43, and then I take on Wake again. The higher level allows Ancient Power to two-shot the Gyarados, so he can't use a Hyper Potion. Against Floatzel, I definitely should have gone for Shadow Force. I tried Dragon Claw to get the two hit at a higher level, but it just barely isn't able to after a Citrus Berry. This means I take some damage from Crunch, Wake uses a Hyper Potion, and then with Shadow Force, I get a critical hit, knocking it out in one turn. Quagsire is all he has left, but it doesn't have super effective damage. Dragon Claw does just under half, it uses Mud Shot, lowering my speed, but Giratina is still faster, and Shadow Force finishes the fight. Heading north of Salacion Town, past the Psyducks, I can now successfully dodge all the trainers here. I use the bike to gain access to the Shadow Ball TM, because it could be useful for Giratina. After that, I have to face Cyrus. Now as a Dark-type specialist, his team could be problematic for Giratina, but in this fight, I'm just doing far too much damage. Following that, I have to take on Barry, which is a change up to the pacing of the narrative. I think they thought the Cyrus battle wasn't consequential enough, so they added in this battle, just so we could have one notable showdown between gym leaders again. And that leads me to my second point about pacing, and that's the game engine. This game is known to run extremely slowly. I think by now everyone in the Pokemon community has seen the video with Blissey's HP depleting after getting hit by a super effective close combat. When I initially set out to start this series, I was very worried that Platinum was just going to take a long time because the game is slow. And honestly, I was right. In most battles in Platinum, I am getting around 240 frames per second, which is 4 times game speed. That said, despite what it says in the top left, in the overworld this frame rate significantly drops. With my limited understanding of how this works, it appears that Platinum, whenever it is rendering 3D objects, has to drop the frame rate in order to keep up with the load. Typically in the overworld, I get somewhere between 145 to 160 frames per second. This is roughly around 2.5 times game speed. When preparing for this series, I was trying to figure out which emulator would allow me to run the game the quickest. What I ended up discovering was a video by Pokemon Challenges, and in that video he shows a version of Desmume, which is capable of going to much higher multiples of game speed. For example, when using it in some areas I can get as high as 1000 frames per second, and generally its lowest range is around 400. That's significantly faster than what I'm getting here with Bizhawk. The question you're probably wondering is, why not just use Desmume? And the answer is fairly simple. The developer of Gamehook, Flamesage, really wanted to develop the port for Bizhawk, just because it's a little bit more advantageous, and the Desmume version that I wanted him to build compatibility with is kind of sketchy. The reason Bizhawk can't get to the same frame rates as Desmume is because it doesn't have a just-in-time recompiler. While this feature does mess with the deterministic RNG within the game, it does allow you to run the game at a significantly faster frame rate. Personally, for my solo runs, I don't think I need frame-perfect RNG. After all, I am not doing a tool-assisted speedrun. But Bizhawk prides itself on its accuracy of emulation, so this feature doesn't make sense to incorporate. This situation leaves these runs in a precarious place. If eventually I want to do multiple runs of Platinum, then the filming time alone is going to be between 8 and 12 hours per video. And I don't even want to think about what an optimized versus video would take. That would be a full month or two month long project for me. This is a call to action. If you have any knowledge about just-in-time recompilers, please reach out to me on X at Psychic Flying. Of course, if I am successfully able to run the game at a consistent 240 frames per second, then these early results that I have collected will no longer be comparable with new runs. Because of that, I think it only makes sense to switch away from Bizhawk once this first attempt series in Pokemon Platinum has concluded. Okay, so that's the technology limited pacing for these runs. Now let's talk about another puzzle inside of Byron. Gym. This one is very similar to the last two. Overall, I like it a lot. However, I dislike the fact that most of the trainers here are mandatory. This isn't all bad though, because some of them are quite challenging. 
specifically Ace Trainer Caesar and his scissor. Is that intentional? I really hope that's intentional because that's really fun. Luckily today, Giratina has no problems here. So now let's take on Byron. This battle is fairly straightforward. Magneton does not have Levitate despite what it looks like, so Earthquake just gets a one hit. Next is Steelix, it survives Earthquake, uses its own, but Giratina shrugs it off, and after a full restore, knocks the Steel-type out. Last is Bastiodon, but it takes four times damage from ground-type moves, so I easily one-shot. The following section of the game has a really strange pace to it. When playing the game, it feels extremely fast. This is fitting because the game is building towards its climax. A narrative tool to build momentum is have important events start taking place at more increasing frequency. The way Platinum pulls this off is have you go to three lakes. In Lake Valor, I have to face Commander Saturn, it's not a problem for Giratina, and then at Lake Verity, I have to face Commander Mars. Again, this is not a problem for Giratina. So theoretically, Theoretically, the pacing choices have made sense to this point, but then the game just makes you go through Mount Coronet, which really stalls out the sense of forward momentum. In here, there are no galactic grunts that you battle, and once you clear the cave, you're just outside in another route with random NPC trainers. And increasing the sense that the plot is just stalling out right before the climax is the fact that you have to go through this extremely slow blizzarding route. I know this was done to build a sense of place where you feel like you're inhabiting a real world, but overall as a gameplay mechanic it just frustrates me endlessly. For Giratina, because I didn't pick up the spooky plate, at the top of this route I can go into this house, talk to the woman, and grab the spell tag. With it, I now have the ability to boost the power of ghost type moves, and that's going to be relevant very soon. Because once again, taking away from the forward momentum of the plot is the fact that you have to face Candice next. If it seems like I'm complaining a lot, let's change that, because this gym puzzle is quite frankly fantastic. It's like the former three, but there are no mandatory battles, and you can always skip every trainer if you want to. Plus, navigating this area is not always intuitive, and it takes a while to get a sense for how to complete the puzzle. I think this is due to the fact that this gym is so large, you can't see the entire puzzle from any vantage point, so you always have to be using your memory to patch in certain things, like where are there little spots where you can stop, where are the ladders, and where are the snowballs that need to be destroyed. Making this puzzle even more interesting is the fact that you don't actually need to break all of the snowballs. I think this is one of the best gym puzzles in the entire series. So with that positivity out of the way, now let's face Candace. Giratina has a type disadvantage here. I'm relying on the fact that it's a legendary and it's going to do enough damage and not take very much in return. Unfortunately, Ancient Power does not knock the Sneasel out in a single hit, so Candace heals it with a Hyper Potion, and that could have been advantageous giving me more turns with Ancient Power, but more time isn't helpful because I don't get the Omni Boost. Frostlass is next, I go for Shadow Force which is super effective, and with the Spell Tag this easily has enough damage. I get lucky against the Pyloswine with a critical hit, and all that's left is a Bomb of Snow. Shadow Force just barely doesn't do enough, so it uses Avalanche, but Giratina survives. However, Candice uses a full restore, and because of hail damage, this still isn't over. I didn't actually know if the weather was going to chip away at me if I used Shadow Force, and it turns out it does. That said, it didn't do enough damage, so Giratina hits, and with that, Candice is defeated. It's of course now time to talk about Pokemon Platinum's plot. The game introduces the enemy team quite early on, and they appear frequently throughout the run. This really diminishes their imposing presence and makes them just feel like a regular part of the world. With that criticism levied, I do want to compliment Platinum because the leaders are much stronger than in Generation 3. The first two with Cyrus are not particularly noteworthy, although in this case with Giratina, I do have one reset to him in the Veilstone building. That's a bit disappointing because the third and final battle with him is is very challenging. This non-linear difficulty progression feels so strange, especially because the second battle with Cyrus does not have any intervening gym battles before the final battle. I think what the developers were thinking is that the battle atop Mount Coronet with the two commanders was going to be the intervening battle, but then there isn't really any time to train your Pokemon before getting to the end of the Distortion World and fighting Cyrus again. Once again, I think Platinum 
loses points for pacing here, but since I'm discussing the plot, I think the more egregious error in this case is the fact that it doesn't really feel like Cyrus would have been able to catch two more Pokemon and train this significantly before the final battle. To me, it really does feel like he just grabbed some rare candies and boosted all his Pokemon's levels and was like, yeah, I have a great team. If immersion is what the plot is trying to achieve, this definitely breaks it. In Ruby, Sapphire, and Emerald, there were two antagonistic teams. I feel this added so much depth and liveliness to the region. It genuinely felt like the world was alive and some conflict was going on that didn't require you. It just so happens that the player's character was caught up in it and was able to bring some sense of resolution. This makes the scenarios feel a lot less contrived, whereas in Pokemon Platinum it doesn't feel that way. All of the galactic grunts are just kind of waiting around for you to show up and battle them. There aren't any other trainers actively resisting them, and like yes, Looker does exist and he walks around and talks to you, but he doesn't take any active action towards furthering the plot or aiding the player, other than like picking up the key which you could have just done yourself, like ah, uh, why did they make him show up, it's so frustrating. Barry definitely has the most active role, however he doesn't really accomplish anything and just shows up at the last minute to help you with this final double battle. With it out of the way, I can journey into the distortion world and here once again I will give Pokemon Platinum a compliment, this place is so aesthetically pleasing. That said, as I said in a previous video, it becomes very monotonous on repeated playthroughs. Because you might be getting tired of me repeating that line, you're probably going to suggest in the comments that I use the patch that removes the distortion world, and yeah that might fix this problem and reduce some of the time for these runs, but overall I don't really like to change major things about the games that I'm playing, especially in my first playthrough series. Okay, so as we're approaching the final battle with Cyrus, I want to talk about him specifically as a character. He is basically the ultimate cliché. He's just a mustache twirling villain with really unconvincing motives. In the western world, it really seems like the Ruby and Sapphire teams had completely outrageous goals as well, but in Japan these motivations make a lot more sense. If you want to know why, I suggest checking out this video by Tamahiro, it is where I learnt about this history. Okay, so I've successfully navigated the entire distortion world, and that leads me to the final battle against Cyrus. His first Pokemon is Houndoom, and I can easily one-shot it with Earthquake. By the way, note here that my Giratina is in origin form. This is because we are in the distortion world, I cannot turn it back into the altered form. Next is Weavile, it moves first with Night Slash, doing about a quarter, and I do more than half with Ancient Power. Because it survived, it gets a hit in with Ice Punch, taking my Giratina under half health before I knock it out. Alright, this is not looking great, I don't think I'm going to one-hit his other three Pokemon. As predicted, the Haunchcrow survives, taking Giratina Giratina down to red health, and while I do polish it off, the following Crobat is faster, it flinches Giratina, and as a result I have a loss. I really don't want that to repeat, so let's use Rare Candies now to boost Giratina from level 55 all the way to 63. I one-shot the Houndoom with Earthquake, two-shot the Weavile using Ancient Power, still no Omni Boost, Crow is next, and I have the damage range I need to knock it out. Because of the level increase, I move first against the Crobat, dealing massive damage with Dragon Claw, and this means that Air Slash can't cause a flinch. Cyrus uses a healing item, but this doesn't change the outcome. Last is Gyarados, while it does intimidate Giratina, which makes absolutely no sense. That's not enough for Cyrus, and I am victorious. This opens the way to battle Giratina, and I think even here in the series, the legendary Pokemon being a part of the plotline was starting to feel a little bit stale. The first time it happened in Generation 3, it made a lot of sense and it was awesome, but then here with only one enemy team, and they aren't really doing anything new, it feels a little bit played out. Maybe that's just me reflecting on this game 15 years later, where legendaries are now a staple in the series, but I do think that Game Freak could have tried to do something a little bit more innovative in this game. If I had to rank all the plots of the games that I'm playing on my channel currently, I would give Generation 3 the top slot, Generation 4 the second slot, because after all, Generation 1 basically doesn't have a plot. And I would put it in third place, because we all know that in Generation 2 the rocket plot line is just completely boring and pointless. This kind of discussion within a solo challenge video might seem completely pointless, but I do think that it helps form the lens by which the player sees the game. For example, whenever I play Generation 2, I always remember the rocket plotline and go, oh, I don't want to do that, that's going to be so boring. Whereas when I sit down to play Generation 3 or Generation 1, I never think that about the enemy team. I'm not sure where on this spectrum I will end up with Pokemon Platinum, but as things stand right now, I think the challenge of many of the team commanders as well as Cyrus himself really redeems it. 
So with the plot properly reviewed, now let's talk about the final gym puzzle. This one is very similar to Maylene's, Crasher Wakes, and Byron's. Once you know what the answer is, it's fairly hard to lose time. I think in terms of solo challenges, this one is a bit disappointing just because so many of the trainers are mandatory. If they were all skippable by using the buttons in precise sequences, then I think this would be more engaging, at least from a choice perspective. That said, this is actually a puzzle, and it is interesting the first time you go through it. Plus, early on in this series I got a bit messed up by it, especially at the end because they establish a pattern and then they go against it, making you go onto one of the red dots and then walk all the way back to Volkner. I really like that little twist. So overall, decent puzzle, but it's nowhere near as good as the one in Snowpoint City. Okay, so I talked about all eight of the puzzles, now let's take on the final gym leader, Volkner. With Earthquake, this fight is going to be trivial. I'm pretty sure Giratina is going to one-hit all of his Pokémon. And I should bring up the difficulty pacing of these games, because it is really weird. In both of my regular attempts where I had a team of Pokémon, it always felt like by the time I got to the Elite Four, I was so underleveled and was struggling against every single member. Then Cynthia felt almost impossible. In solo challenges, this is a lot more wonky. In previous videos, I have talked about how the early game makes it very hard for Pokémon of specific typings. We expanded on that today with the talk about the plates being placed throughout the runs, and I want to put one more observation out there now. The fact that you fight Cyrus before this means most Pokemon will be using rare candies earlier on, and then by the time you're fighting the electric gym leader he's just a complete joke. I think it might have been better to put Cyrus after Volkner and let the 8th gym leader feel like an actual challenge. Okay, so it's time for a cave review. How is Victory Road compared to all of the other Victory Roads in the series? Well, if we compare it to any of the modern games, this one is so much better. It's also much better than Generation 2 because that cave is essentially empty, there's nothing to do, there's no puzzles, it's so simple. I think nostalgia tries to convince me that in Generation 1, Victory Road was at its most interesting, but I don't think that's the case. Objectively, I think the Generation 3 Victory Road is the hardest to navigate. I got so lost in there two years ago when I did my first attempt of the game with Butterfree. Generation 1 has some neat puzzles, but it's definitely not as good as the Victory Road here in Pokemon Platinum. And while HMs are really annoying because they take up precious move slots, I do like the fact that this one requires so many of them to properly navigate. Another thing that makes it a little bit disorienting to navigate is that there are ladders taking you to other regions, and it's not always clear which way is the proper direction to go. For example, here with the pawns, like, which way am I supposed to go? If I didn't know, it wouldn't be clear. This encourages exploration, and I really love that. At the end of the area, I pick up the TM for Dragon Pulse, and I'm going to teach this right away to Giratina in the place of Dragon Claw. With that, I can finish off Victory Road, emerge from the cave, and face the final six trainers. Berries first, but Giratina is very overleveled, and Intimidate might have lowered my attack stat, but I have Dragon Pulse, so I can use this instead. Empoleon is a Steel type, and it takes super effective damage from Earthquake, so I only need two turns to knock it out. And if that seemed simple, things get even easier from here. I almost one-hit the Heracross. It does some damage with Night Slash, but nothing to worry about. Of course, Snorlax is a beefy boy, so of course he hangs on, but it only takes two turns to finish. Last is Rapidash. This is probably Barry's weakest Pokemon. Earthquake finishes it in one hit. Now, let's take on the Elite Four for the last time in the year. Eren is first, and of course his Yanmega goes down to a single Ancient Power. Still no Omni Boost. I feel like I've been a little bit shortchanged. Next he sends in his Drapion, but Earthquake just knocks it out in one hit. Scissor survives, doesn't do very much. The Heracross also survives, once again not doing very much. And the final Vespaquin goes down to a single Ancient Power. Before Bertha, I decide to use my final rare candies, boosting Giratina from level 69 all the way up to level 74. Dragon Pulse one hits her Whiskash as well as the Gliscor, but the Hippowdon does survive with a sliver of health and it uses Yawn. Bertha buys time with a healing item, but I roll better damage on the next hit, so it goes down. But I'm still asleep for the Rhyperior. It starts using Earthquake, which is doing decent damage, I guess. Eventually though, Giratina wakes up and starts using its own Earthquakes. 
but it's not doing very much and my legendary has only red health left over by the time the Rhyperior faints. I need to one hit the golem. Here I wanted to use a special move so I go for dragon pulse, it doesn't do enough and the golem knocks Giratina out. Knowing that I have one hit rolls against the hip out on, I just come back into the fight, get one, move on to the Rhyperior. Things are so much easier this time because I make it to the golem with green health, and then Giratina gets a crit. Of the Elite Four members, it really feels like Bertha is the best. Flint, who follows, is not nearly as intimidating. I've noticed against him that burn can be problematic because the Magmortar does have flame body. But Earthquake doesn't make contact, so Giratina doesn't have to worry about that. Last is Lucian, and he really is not that good. Honestly, he is more of a frustration just because the Bronzong has Levitate. That makes it a lot harder to knock out. But in this case, I have Shadow Force, and it's super effective, so I do get the one hit. The Ghost move continues to put in work against his final two Pokemon, and with that, I have made it to Cynthia. Because I know the Spiritomb is up first, I have taught Giratina Charge Beam in the place of Ancient Power. This move has a 70% chance to raise your special attack, which will really improve Dragon Pulse's damage. My second and third hits both trigger the boost, giving me plus two by the time she sends in Garchomp. This Pokemon was supposed to be incredibly intimidating, but it really hasn't been in these solo runs. Dragon Pulse easily one-shots it, and I move on to the Lucario, who's next. And I think my feeling about Cynthia's Garchomp can really be applied to her entire team. When I first started planning Pokemon Platinum, I really thought she was going to be the most difficult trainer, but now I think that Cyrus might be. Of course, due to type effectiveness, sometimes the gym leaders are also very problematic, especially if they come early on before rare candies. Cynthia being easy suggests something else to me. I think that in these runs I am overleveling. And over the next year of playing Pokemon Platinum, I look forward to improving my play in that area. With the champion's final Pokemon going down, Giratina clocks in with its final time. 2 hours, 20 minutes, and 50 seconds, with 6 resets at level 76. This is a game time of 6 hours and 28 minutes. Unsurprisingly, Giratina is the fastest Pokemon through the game yet. In second place was the Star Raptor line, which had a time of 2 hours, 49 minutes, and 21 seconds. Giratina also beat its 8 resets with only 6, and it is the lowest level finish that I've got so far. Not to mention its game time is an hour and five minutes faster than Star Raptors. A year ago, if you had told me in the first week of Pokemon Platinum I would get a time that is under two hours and 30 minutes, I think I just would have laughed at you. But Giratina was really good, and I do think that my preparation for this series was vastly superior to what it has been in the past. Today, of course, Giratina earns itself the top placement in my Pokemon Platinum tier list. If you're wondering why I'm not doing a real-time tier list and a game-time tier list, it's pretty simple. The real-times and the game-times give the exact same ranking. It's really nice when the data lines up like that. Playing Pokemon Platinum in seven solo runs over the last week has taught me a lot about it as a game. I really love how difficult some of the fights can be. I specifically think of Crasher Wake and Cyrus, who were both quite surprising. I love the gym puzzles. I think of any Pokemon game, it is the best collection of eight, even when it includes the silly clock in Gardenia's gym. I'm not a huge fan of how the battles are paced throughout the game, but that said, it does make a good video because there's like a gym battle and then a different battle and then a gym battle, so I can very conveniently switch up the music tracks and it all just works out really nicely. I didn't have time to review the music of the game because that would take an entire video, after all I am a musician. But I will say that I really appreciate the fact that there are so many battle tracks. It keeps the game feeling interesting and fresh. I criticize the pacing, the script, and the game engine, but all of those things together really do create a relaxing experience. If we consider the other games that I play on my channel, Yellow, Crystal, Emerald, and Fire Red, of all of them, Platinum feels the most laid back. I think it's going to be my go-to game whenever I'm feeling tired, or I feel like I just need to have a restful day recording. And because of how it interacts with the other games I play, in the end I think the negatives I mentioned throughout this video are actually positives for my specific use case. With this miniseries under my belt, I am feeling very excited for more adventures and solo runs in Pokemon Platinum. Stay tuned for those, they will likely start airing sometime in March. Because this is the last video of the year, I will remind you I am taking 
a vacation in January. Well, kind of a vacation. A vacation from produced videos. During the month, I'll be doing a lot of live streams, so tune into those if you're interested. If you've supported me at any time during this year, thank you so much. It really does mean the world to me. If you've made it this far, you are incredible. I'll see you in next year's videos.